My name is Michelle Lavander, and I'm the editor of ReportingOnHealth.org, an initiative of the University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Journalism. Today you are participating in our new webinar series on critical issues in health and health journalism. In a moment, you'll hear from our guest speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Brenner, founder of the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers. Dr. Brenner doesn't think small. He's a pioneer who's reinventing the way that medical care is delivered in America. A data geek with a heart, this family physician studied the trends in Camden, one of the nation's poorest and most violent cities, to find out how health care could be delivered more effectively and humanely. Simple practical measures and compassion go a long way in his model. So does data. His coalition cares for his city's sickest and most intractable cases, and he's already seen progress in stopping the revolving door of emergency room visits uh, that lead to poor care and higher costs. Before we get started, I'd like to offer a few suggestions. Dr. Brenner plans to go through his presentation in about a half hour and then leave a half hour for questions. We'll be muting all our participants during his presentation. During the question and answer period, please raise your electronic hand or send us a question electronically through your dashboard. Uh, then we will unmute you and uh, you'll be able to ask a question. We'll do our best to get to all of you. And now, Let's get underway. Dr. Brenner, welcome. Thank you very much, Michelle. And thank you for the chance to talk with all of you. You should be able to see my slides now. And I'm going to talk for about a half an hour, and then uh, that should leave at least a half an hour for questions. Uh, my name is Jeff Brenner. I'm a family doctor. I've been working in the city of Camden for about 12 years, mostly as a frontline provider, seeing kids, adults, and delivering babies. I worked in a small three-exam room office seeing mostly Medicaid patients. The work I'm going to talk about today really comes out of the very much the frustrations of being a frontline provider. And um, uh, the first slide that I'm showing you is a slide that shows the long-term federal debt. And uh, if you look at this slide, the line in the middle, the dotted line, is 2010. And this goes through to 2080. And uh, if you look forward in time, the bulk of the long-term federal debt is health care. So the light blue area is the proportion of the federal debt that's due to Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and the exchange subsidies. Even if the Affordable Care Act had not been passed and Obamacare was not the law of the land, Medicare and Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program were still the bulk of the long-term federal debt going forward. Um, the dark blue area is Social Security, and the lightest blue at the bottom is other non-interest spending. So that's defense and all the other things that our government does, federal government. So if you're concerned about the long-term federal debt, the issue is not Social Security. The issue is health care, health care, and health care. And the problem is that we don't even have a common agreement in our country of what's causing the cost increases. So it's really not even possible at a public dialogue level to begin having an intelligent discussion about how to bend that curve and reduce the long-term trend on healthcare spending if you don't even agree on what's causing the problem. Um, healthcare presses people's buttons in very funny ways and causes very strong emotional reactions. Um, so much of our work is ultimately focused on this problem, which is um, in the city of Camden, how do we make the city of Camden the first city in the country to dramatically bend the cost curve and improve quality? There are really only two ways of addressing this problem. One way would be to ration care, and rationing comes in many shapes and sizes. Um, many of you have experienced rationing firsthand. Rationing could be upping your copay, upping your deductible, upping your employee contribution. It could be restricting your benefits, changing your formulary. It often is like a thousand small paper cuts. Um, you know, rationing can be very dramatic where you simply don't cover a necessary service or you um, throw people off of um, a benefit, like cut them off Medicaid. But often rationing is much more subtle um, and process, and we all experience it in some way, shape, or form. Restricting a benefit is a very easy thing to do. It's a decision that you can make quarter over quarter, year over year, and realize instant savings. The much harder thing that we're going to need to do is to rationalize the delivery system, which is to think hard about the delivery system and make it more effective and more productive. 
um, healthcare and education share two things in common, which is we spend more and more and more every year, often spending goes up by about 7 to 10% a year in healthcare, um, but uh, productivity has really remained flat. Um, and the same thing has happened in education as well. We're spending more and more and more and not necessarily getting our money's worth. So let me give you some specific examples of what I'm talking about. The next slide is um, data that's drawn from the city of Camden. Camden is nine square miles, 79,000 people, and it's the first, second, or third poorest city in the country. It's also one of the most dangerous cities in the country. It's in New Jersey, directly across the water from Philadelphia, and uh, it's been in various levels of state takeover. It's police department, it's schools, it's city government uh, for the last 15 years. Um, it turns out to be a really good place to do this work, though. Uh, we managed to get billing data back in 2003 from Cooper, Lourdes, and Virtua. Um, there are two hospitals, inpatient hospitals, and three emergency rooms in the city of Camden. And we managed over three years as a med student project to collect all of the billing data from these three hospitals with name, address, date of birth, date of admission, all the charges received, the insurance information, and the diagnosis codes for every Camden resident. Because the city is so poor, the primary payers for Camden residents to get care is the public. It's either Medicare for people over 65 or disabled, or it's Medicaid, or some people have both insurances. What we, we now have 10 years of that data, and the word for this is called an all-payer data set. And it's very unusual for people like me to get a hold of data like this, so a frontline provider to get access to this kind of data. Uh, we quickly learned that half the population uses an ER hospital in one year, and that someone actually had gone 324 times in five years to both the ED and the hospitals, 113 times in one year, and that uh, we have a sister organization up in Trenton. They found someone who'd been 450 times to the ERs and hospitals up in Trenton. So, so far in the country, that's the leading uh, uh, high utilizer. The total revenue for the Camden hospitals, just for Camden residents, just for hospital and emergency room care, is $100 million a year. That doesn't count the meds, the outpatient visits, the radiology visits, all the other things. That's only hospital and emergency room care. I look at that number and I think of all the great things that we could be doing with that money. I would say that we're not buying you know, better lives, we're not changing people's lives, that what we're doing is sick care, not health care. A small amount of that money could buy much better primary care, could buy much better patient education, um, could, could really do a lot for um, patients at the community level. The single most expensive patient, one person over five years, had $3.5 million in receipts for their care. 30% of the costs go to 1% of the patients, 80% of the costs go to 13% of the patients, and 90% of the costs go to 20% of the patients. That basic rule of 30% of, of costs going to 1% of patients is true in whichever bucket you look. It's true for employed populations, it's true for union populations, it's true for um, Medicare recipients. It's true for the entire population. There have been a lot of reports recently coming out about this, um, looking in various data sets that essentially, in healthcare, a small sliver of patients are driving much of the cost. The problem with how our healthcare system is designed is that, by and large, we ignore those patients unless you can cut, scan, zap, or hospitalize them, which, in which case you can make a lot of money on them. Uh, but we don't spend a lot of time paying attention to them, talking to them, educating them, making sure that they get their needs met. About one quarter of Medicare recipients, people over 65, are, are re-hospitalized, readmitted to the hospital within 30 days. So, um, you know, I think that's one more indication uh, of how we're ignoring sick people and not paying attention to people who are leaving the hospital. So good doctors and good hospitals do incredible things every day. They transplant hearts and lungs and do amazing things, and then they send people out into the community and they fall off a cliff into a very complex, disorganized, and fragmented delivery system. And I think um, this data um, helps to show this. The number one emergency room diagnosis in Camden over a five-year period is head colds. 12,000 visits in the city of Camden for head colds over a five-year period. 
Number two is ear infection, 7,000 visits. Number three is viral infection, 7,000 visits. Number four is sore throat, asthma, stomach virus. These are all primary care problems. This is what I went to work every day and did in my primary care office. These are essentially poor moms and kids sitting in emergency rooms in Camden for four or six hours waiting to get seen, and most of them have Medicaid cards. So this is even before the Medicaid expansion. And what I can tell you from the billing data is that the hospitals have paid $150, $300, or $500 for these visits. And in my time in Camden, the emergency rooms have tripled in size. We built new wings on the hospitals, but primary care offices like mine have gone out of business. So my uh, primary care office is currently boarded up, um, and primary care offices in Camden really have no value. Um, Medicaid rates in New Jersey are some of the lowest in the country and got lower and lower during my time in practice. So I would be paid $19 to $35 for these visits, while the hospitals were being paid $150, $300, $400 for these visits, which I think is really a metaphor for what's going on in the country, which is in the marketplace of service delivery, we overpay for sick care for uh, patients who are hospitalized or patients that have procedures, and we underpay and undervalue talking to patients and coordinating their care and educating patients. So essentially, um, in the Medicare fee schedule and in all fee schedules in the country, the way doctors are paid is uh, in a volume-based delivery model. And if you cut, scan, zap, or hospitalize, uh, you get paid much more per unit of service than if you talk to patients. Furthermore, the basic business model of a hospital um, and many other parts of the delivery system is the same business model as the hotel and the airline industry, which is it's a volume-based model, and it's closely related to occupancy rates. So hospitals don't make money or not in the business of keeping people out of the hospital. They make money from keeping people in the hospital or from filling the beds in the hospital. That's true for specialty offices. That's true for CAT scanners. That's true for MRIs. That's true for all of the technology we have, which is once you've bought or leased the machine, you want to fill the machine with as many people as you can, which is a fundamental problem in our healthcare system in America is the misalignment of financial incentives. This is called a geographic segmentation of the data. This is um, billing data for five years for Camden residents at their home address to look and see if there are, are geographic patterns of where people live in the city based on their cost of care. So this is a map of the city of Camden at the census block level, which are very small geographies. And the little red areas on there are very small geography, census blocks, which like is a city block. 6%, the red areas are 6% of the census blocks, 10% of the land mass, 18% of the patients, 27% of the visits to the emergency rooms and hospitals, and 37% of the receipts, the payments that the hospitals received. So essentially, the moral of the story here on this map is that high-cost patients in Camden are congregated into housing units and live on top of one another. Um, these two buildings here are the most expensive buildings in the city. They're both beautiful buildings with great management. This is not the fault of the building owners or the management. Um, the building at the top has what are called dual eligibles. Those are poor, elderly and, elderly and disabled residents, over 50 in the building, it's called Northgate 2. 600 patients over five years had 12 million in payments just for their hospital and ER care. Abigail House, which is a subacute rehab and nursing home, had 300 patients with 15 million in receipts over a five-year period. Um, and these buildings are about six blocks away from a major academic health center. You'd think that this was 600 miles away from an academic health center. It turns out that you can identify these buildings in your own community by simply asking the EMS service, the paramedics, or the emergency room docs, which buildings do you get transfers from over and over and over? and they can tell you. So you can certainly find the, you know, these buildings if you get a hold of the data, but you can also just ask people and you can find these buildings often. Um, we have sister organizations in Trenton and Newark that have been incorporated as nonprofits. They have um, the hospitals and the primary care providers on their board, housing providers, mental health providers as we do as well, and we've been helping them analyze their data. Uh, this is data from uh, a hospital up in Newark 
mapping out new work to see if there's similar geographic patterns. And the answer is that there are. We've also done maps in Trenton that show similar patterns of patients congregated into buildings who are high cost complex patients. We applied the same basic idea to Maine and um, Maine Care, the Maine Medicaid program, provided patient level data for three counties and we mapped it, graphed it, charted it. It's publicly available, the report. And essentially the message from this report is that high cost complex patients who were Medicaid recipients in Maine are congregated into town centers that as you get older and more disabled in Maine, it's hard to live in the middle of nowhere, that you end up getting congregated to, to town centers, which really makes the problem much easier potentially to, uh, to deal with. I want to, one thing I often hear people do is they talk about ER use and hospital use in the same sentence. And they're actually different phenomenon. And we think that there is probably different kinds of overutilizers in the healthcare system that can be overlapping but distinctive. So you could be a medication overutilizer, say someone who's on 15 or 20 meds. You could be a, a radiologic high utilizer. We found a patient at a hospital who had 125 x-rays and CAT scans in the last two years. You could be an inpatient high utilizer or an emergency room high utilizer. Um, so this is something called a typology. This is the entire Camden data set from one year of every patient, this is patient level data, who'd been to the emergency room or hospital. And let me show you how to read this. At the top are inpatient visits, and on the left side are ED visits from one year. If you look at the lower left-hand corner where it says 339, that's 339 patients who had no ED visits in a one-year period but were admitted to the hospital 10 or more different times. That's a very special kind of person because every time they came to the emergency room, they scared the doctor so much that the doctor sent them upstairs for a stay at the inn. That's distinctly different from um, the cell the higher up there were 26,000 people who had one admission to the hospital, but uh, no ED visits. Now let's look at the lower right-hand corner. There are 62 people who had five or more trips uh, into the hospital, but 10 or more emergency room visits. So that means 10 or more times they were just treated in the ER and released in one year period, but five or more times they were admitted to the hospital. They scared the doctor enough to get sent upstairs. So they're coming both for their primary care to the emergency room and they're coming for their specialty care, they're coming for you know, a trip to the ICU. These are very sick patients. But the point of this um, typology is that in healthcare we often blend all this data together. And we, we, we blend the data together in the wrong kind of ways. And we even talk about the problem in very primitive ways. And it's important to distinguish between ER overutilization and inpatient overutilization because the, the programs you would build, the treatment, and the way you would deal with the problems is probably different. So there are certainly, these are like Venn diagrams of overlapping categories. Um, this is a visualization of the most frequent utilizer in Camden. This is one patient. This is one year represented. And on the bottom is, um, is time. And each of these red lines represents a stay in a hospital in Camden. The length of the red line, or the height of it, is how many days the patient stayed. The blue ticks are emergency room visits. So you can see this patient had, a, in February, a three-day stay, then a six-day stay, a five-day stay, a four-day stay. Each one of these is like you know, two weeks apart. Then a three-day stay. Then they had a 14-day stay you know, through the ICU. Finally got all their issues taken care of and then was out of the hospital for three months, but was in the ER three or four times a week. Each of those blue ticks is an ER visit. And then a new crescendo of two days, four days, five days, eight days. We think that part of what we're trying to do is figure out new ways of visualizing utilization. So this is like an EKG of healthcare utilization for one patient. Our organization is incorporated as a nonprofit. It started about 10 years ago as a breakfast group of primary care providers hanging out for about three years having breakfast. We're incorporated as a nonprofit. My board members are uh, three local hospitals, two federally qualified health centers, small private offices, a homeless shelter, 
We've got the AARP on the board. Um, Camden residents have come on the board, a church group. So it's a bit of a Noah's Ark of, of various stakeholders in the city. We do data sharing and data analysis. We run what's called a health information exchange, which is real-time labs, radiology results, and hospital discharge summaries streaming into the organization. We do a lot of care management, care coordination, uh, primary care and specialty care redesign, really rethinking how providers operate their offices, patient education, uh, a fair amount of research and evaluation, and policy and advocacy work. I want to talk through a case just to give you a sense of, of what it is we do. Um, this is a patient that we picked up. Uh, we, we, admit, we enroll patients who are admitted to the hospital. So what we're focused on primarily right now are the many, many, many patients who are being hospitalized over and over and over. One hospitalization costs you and I about $10,000. The ER visit costs about $150 to $300. So our target right now are patients who are admitted to the hospital, and we show up in the hospital. This is a 55-year-old male um, who was admitted uh, with a stomach bleed, and he was short of breath. He is what's called a dual eligible. He has both Medicaid and Medicare, and he lives alone in a high-rise apartment. This is a really complicated patient. This is a patient with end-stage renal disease, that's kidney failure, kidney cancer, hepatitis B, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, blockages in his arteries, asthma, glaucoma, sleep apnea, and severe back pain. So, you know, poverty is, is hell on your body. Um, he's on 12 medications a day. Um, in the last six months before we cared for him, he'd had nine ER visits, six inpatient visits, and his average time between being admitted to the hospital was about 45 days. Um, he was on, uh, he is on SSI, and his family was very resistant to him going into subacute rehab because they were worried that he would get admitted to a nursing home, and they would lose access to his income. Um, he was identified through uh, every day we get uh, data out of our health information exchange of who's been admitted to all the local hospitals within 24 hours. And we go up and meet the patients at the bedside. So we identify patients through a data sharing mechanism that operates citywide. And we go up, up to their bedside. So in November 2011, he was enrolled. And to give you a sense of his care, he's at the middle here of what we did for care coordination is um, we went to the first hospital he was in, picked him up there, followed him out to subacute rehab. Then he had a repeat hospitalization because of an, another medical issue that needed to be taken care of. We coordinated his home nursing, home PT, home OT, transport, meals, um, crutches, wheelchair, uh, dialysis, got him in to see his nephrologist, got him on the transplant list, um, got him in to see his primary care provider, um, he needed to see urology, oncology, and surgery because of the kidney cancer. He needed to see an eye doctor, pain management, uh, GI for the stomach uh, bleed, and went to see cardiology as well. For us, believe it or not, he is an intermediate risk patient. He is not a high risk patient. This is a curve of his utilization. So the red part is the one year before we picked him up. Each red line is a, in an inpatient stay and the blue lines are ER visits. He had 312,000 in charges, 59,000 in payments. The charges of the bill sent out, receipts is the payment that came in. And then after we picked him up, in the six months following, he had uh, no costs, no hospitalizations. Here's all of his meds. So you can imagine how confused he was when he got home to sort out all his medications. All of our work is in the field. We pick people up in the hospital. Um, go uh, see them at home within 24 hours, go with them to their primary care appointment, and go with them to their key specialty appointments. We sit in the waiting room, go into the exam room with the patient, and help their, their provider sort things out. And this is his primary care provider. Um, the person in the middle is Corinne. She's an AmeriCorps health coach. She graduated college and has spent a year, um, she's pre-med, um, running around Camden at doing care coordination, care navigation, and support. So she's the one that went with him to his appointments, helped him make appointments, and she's going to be a fantastic nurse, doctor, or public health practitioner um, you know, later in her life. We use a lot of AmeriCorps health coaches. 
Uh, and the person on the right is, uh, is a nurse that works for us, Jason Torrey. And the gentleman sitting in front of us is the patient, and he's, he's doing quite well now. Um, I'm going to skip over this case. I want to talk about one of the things that we've been doing in Camden is community organizing. And I believe deeply that healthcare is not going to change on its own. It needs external pressure to change. So we teamed up with a church group called Camden Churches Organized for People. That's part of a national group called PICO. And this was a retreat that we did where we brought church members from across the city um, into a, uh, an educational retreat. And I sent them out to visit all of my stakeholders. They went to the, visit the CEOs of the local hospital, to the head of New Jersey Medicaid, to a Medicaid HMO. And they came out and they mapped out the flow of money in the system and the point of view of each stakeholder, which is classic community organizing, so that they could be more involved in nudging the system along. Then we came together in a church in the evening, and we talked about the data. And the woman in the right is a woman who lives in Northgate 2, one of the buildings I showed you. She could barely look me in the eye when I first met her. She has sarcoidosis and was really frustrated about the kind of care that she'd been receiving. And she's standing up giving a testimonial and talking about that. She's been up to Trenton. She's hosted visits in the building. She's been down to DC to talk to CMS officials. And we've really built a leadership team with the help of Camden Churches Organized for People in the building. The person on the left is a, uh, the CEO of the biggest hospital in Camden, talking about how hard it is to run an urban hospital. There are state officials, the head of the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, um, talking about the challenges the business has of ever-increasing healthcare premiums. And we hung a covenant on the wall, which was a promise that everyone in the delivery system, all of us, patients, doctors, hospitals, insurers, the state, we're all going to have to start behaving differently. Because behind closed doors, they all blame one another. But in the end, they all need to start owning the problem. And they're all going to have to change. And we're going to have to come up with new language about how we talk about this problem. Um, we made two concrete promises to one another. One was to, to build a prototype in Northgate, to really work with Northgate residents to help them in the way that they wanted to be helped. And the second was to work on shared savings legislation, which would allow the coalition to capture the savings that we're generating. This is a ribbon cutting with CMS federal officials, with our senator, our mayor, our congressman, and Pilar. And this is in Northgate 2, one of the most expensive buildings in the city. And uh, this was a ribbon cutting for a two exam room primary care office that one of our board members, who runs a private practice, opened with no grant money and no federal funds. So based on our billing data, we're able to figure out that there was a business model that we have here. Um, and it's been about a year now, and about 115 patients who live in the building have switched over to this health center to get their care. So they only need to come down the elevator instead of having to deal with uh, Medicaid transportation and, and moving around through the system. This is data from Camden, Trenton, and Newark for the top 1% of emergency room high utilizers. In Camden, in a one-year period, it's 386 patients. They went for 5,000 visits to the emergency room. And in one year, it's 13 visits per patient. And 80% go to more than one hospital. In Trenton, similar, and in Newark, similar. Uh, so it's not only true for um, ER high utilizers, but it's also true for inpatient high utilizers, that they're highly mobile, and they go from ER to ER, hospital to hospital, in search of better care because they're not getting it in the community. And the point of this is to show that one hospital and one clinic can't solve this, that I think this problem operates at the community level. And it has to do with um, how a hospital should be collaborating with a primary care office, with the specialists, with the homeless shelter, with all the other penalty of services that exist in these communities, that we built an incredibly complex, very fragmented model and that we're going to need a new language of how we work together. We embodied that basic idea in a piece of legislation that had bipartisan sponsorship uh, to create a Medicaid accountable care organization demo project. And uh, it was signed by Chris Christie back in October. Um, the principal supporter of it was the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce. They hired a lobbyist to help get this passed. And it's essentially the idea of 
um, better care at lower cost with no upfront funding. Accountable care organizations are being, or ACOs are being talked about all over the country. Uh, and essentially, it's, it's often going to be a hospital and all the affiliated doctors working together in a more integrated and collaborative way and allowing them to, um, to, to share revenue in the process. My fear in Camden is that we would end up with a Cooper, Lords, and Virtua ACO fighting over poor people, which would be a complete disaster. So our model is uh, to put them under the roof of one nonprofit, um, have you know the churches working together with a homeless shelter, with the three hospitals, with the primary care providers, uh, to make the city of Camden the first city in the country to bend the cost curve. And this legislation sets us up to be able to um, to share in the savings generated from that. We've signed a contract with one Medicaid HMO, which is United Healthcare in Camden, which will allow us to capture the savings that we generate. So my recommendations for you is healthcare is really hard to write about. And I've been very disappointed with the reporting and the dialogue, public dialogue about the Affordable Care Act, because I feel like we're talking about the wrong thing. In many ways, the dialogue has been about how do you pay for care instead of what you want to buy. It's as if we went to a, um, uh, a car dealer, and instead of talking about which car we wanted to buy, we spent the whole time arguing about how we were going to finance it. And I don't think there's really been a public dialogue about what good care looks like. And uh, you know, I think people think good care is separating Siamese twins or some, you know, crazy medical procedure that very few people will ever need, rather than what the basic attributes of good care look like, what the cost drivers are. I think there's tremendous misunderstanding about the cost drivers. And what are some of the methods that we've begun to learn around the country about reducing the cost while at the same time improving quality? We have an industry that you know somehow got bypassed by the revolution that's happened in business. You know, the last hundred years, America's become very wealthy because business has gotten more and more productive. They do more and more and more with less and less and less. Somehow education and healthcare got bypassed in that revolution of productivity. And the writing has been primitive at best, I think, around the, the um, kind of uh, increases in productivity that we're going to need in healthcare in order to afford the 85 million baby boomers headed towards the delivery system. So I'm going to give you some specific examples of good care that you should visit. A PACE program, Program for All-Inclusive Care of the Elderly, an ACT team, Assertive Community Treatment. A PACE program is, um, is a, a program for um, poor elderly people to keep them out of a nursing home. An ACT team is a psychiatric hospital without walls to move people out of psychiatric hospitals into the community. A Ryan White Clinic is an HIV clinic, and they do full wraparound care. And the Nurse Family Partnership, which is for high-risk first-time moms. Um, and I would encourage you to embed yourself in these kind of clinical programs um, and begin to talk about what are the attributes of good care. Good care is face-to-face. -face. Good care is responsive. Good care means that you're never out of sight, out of mind. Good care means that someone's going to go looking for you if you've been in the hospital recently. Good care means that you understand your illness, that you're activated and engaged in your care. Um, and I would argue that if that's the definition of good care, none of us are getting good care. And you often don't know it until you're very, very sick and you get lost in the delivery system. So let me stop there. It's a good time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Brenner. This is Michelle Levander, the editor of Reporting on Health. We um, have a few questions already. Um, and just a reminder to everybody that what you can do is uh, there's a part of your dashboard where you can just click on this little hand icon. And that will tell us that you have a question. Uh, when I call on you, maybe just quickly um, say your news outlet or your affiliation if you're not a journalist. Um, and that will help us. I'm, I'm going to start with a question from uh, Lisa Alaferis from KQED, she says, uh, Dr. Brenner neglected to say what happened to the patient after the intervention. Uh, did the cost plummet? Um, 
the patient that I described had no ER visits or hospital visits in the six months after we picked him up. Our intervention lasts for 60 to 90 days. So in the three months since we graduated him, he has not been back. Um, he's a recent case, so I don't have any time beyond that. They are, and, uh, all, they are all not home runs. These are very difficult patients. Um, you know, some we knock out of the ballpark, some are much more challenging. And Dr. Brenner, I have the sense that some of the patients that you um, care for, what you're providing that gets them out of the ER is not necessarily medical care. It's things like food and necessities. Can you talk about that part of your model? I think the most important part ends up being emotional support and, um, uh, and help in navigating the system. You know, right now, if any of you called up to get a primary care appointment because you had a, a sinusitis or an ear infection, you'd call up, you'd get stuck in the phone system, you'd leave a message, no one would call you back maybe until the end of the day. If you did get through, you'd have to argue with the front desk staff that you were indeed really sick and needed to be seen. You'd go there, you'd sit in the waiting room for an hour, you'd sit in the exam room for a half hour, the doctor would come in and five minutes run back out the door. That's a totally inadequate delivery system for someone who's really sick in a wheelchair and has just been hospitalized and feels terrible and may not have a car, may not even have a phone, and may not have family support to get them there. We're going to call on Peggy uh, Kint. Uh, Peggy, I'm unmuting you. Peggy, did you want to ask your question? Okay, we'll come back to Peggy. We're going to move on to um, James Davis. James, I'm about to unmute you, and you can ask your question. James? Oh, wait, that didn't quite work. There we go. James, did you have a question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Brenner, I'm, I'm Jamie Davis, the pod medic from the ProMed Network. Um, I'm working paramedic is also an, and a nurse. And uh, one of the things that I think frustrates the EMS side of the equation uh, very much is the disconnect between what we see and what uh, and how we are uh, not necessarily an active part of seen as an active part of healthcare. Um, some of the programs that are going on out there that I think are really making a huge difference as well include um, uh, community paramedic programs uh, that we see in Wake County, um, North Carolina, parts of Colorado and other parts around the country. I'm wondering um, where they do home visits and follow up at the direction of primary care providers in those areas. Um, have you looked at anything like this and do you see these types of programs being part of this integration of healthcare? Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more and thank you for bringing that up. And you know, to be totally clear, we're not the people to invent this idea. Better care at lower cost for complex patients has been something that reappears periodically about every 10 years and there are lots of good ideas out there. Um, there's not been enough research and there's not been enough work in this field. The literature, the research, the publications in this are very primitive at best. And um, the questioner is absolutely right. There's been some great work with EMS and paramedic services uh, around the country um, to uh, use them as extenders out in the community. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I think Baltimore's got a, a nice program as well and people in DC have been working on this also, uh, we have not gotten a hold of EMS and paramedic data yet in Camden, and I'm dying to. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, there are a lot of patients that get visited by paramedics, but not necessarily transported, who refuse transport, who we think eventually end up in the hospital. So we think it would be a good sentinel system to be able to get a hold of that data. So thank you for the question. We have a question from uh, Janet Ray Dupree. She says, why are these programs limited to the poor? Coordinated, all-inclusive care for the elderly in particular would benefit everyone. I can't agree with you more. And it would be a terrible outcome for you to view our work in Camden as poverty work. I think this is healthcare redesign work. And the reason that I'm getting away with this in Camden, and we haven't been shut down, is because no one's fighting over more market share of poor people. Because keep in mind, what we're doing is emptying hospital beds, emptying emergency room beds. If I was doing this out in the suburbs with your middle class, upper class parents, I'd have my legs cut out from under me. 
So, you know, it, it, unfortunately, the business model we've made for hospitals and healthcare organizations is that they need to fill the bed. And that's why this work is not, um, you know, uh, moving as quickly as it should move. There are a lot of ideas in the Affordable Care Act to incentivize and realign the incentives. Um, accountable care organizations are one piece of this. Patient Center Medical Homes, another piece. But this is not poverty work. All of the things that our team does, the baby boomers who are aging place out in the suburbs are going to need that too. What I encourage you to read is there's a, a wonderful project called Health Quality Partners in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, who's doing great work with middle class Medicare patients, showing that good in-home care coordination, care management, can reduce the death rate, reduce costs, reduce readmissions, and improve um, life outcomes. So, you know, and when I sit down with him, the things that our teams are doing are very similar. The way we structure our projects, the way we handle data, are very similar. As I talk to people around the country doing similar work, you know, the, fundamentally what this is, is a business problem. It's a process engineering problem of how do you get enough talented good people out in the field to the homes and the bedsides of patients, touching the right patients, and landing them back into their primary care offices, and how do you redesign primary care so that you're actually catching sick people and paying attention to them? That's a massive problem going forward. So we have a question from Melanie Igorin with the, um, oh, no, her question just vanished. Here we go. With the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, Subcommittee on Health, uh, her question is, what is the proportion of dual eligible beneficiaries? Were there different differences in inputs and outputs between duals and non-duals? And maybe in your answer, Dr. Brenner, you can explain to everyone these categories that uh, Melanie's mentioning. Absolutely. So uh, a Medicare recipient is someone who is over 65. So everyone is eligible for Medicare over 65. Or if you have a work history and you become disabled, um, you can go into Medicare. Medicaid is for people below a certain income threshold. And if you're both, um, you had a work history so that you're eligible for Medicare and, um, and your income is very low, so you're, you're disabled and poor or you're elderly and poor, then you can become what's called a dual eligible. So you end up on both Medicare and Medicaid. So keep in mind that Medicare only pays 80% of your bills and you still have a copay and deductible. So for people who are dual eligibles, the Medicare is picking up 80% and then the Medicaid is picking up 20%. So if that's not confusing enough, Medicare is a federal program with federal guidelines and it's you know kind of uniform across the country more or less. Medicaid is state by state by state. So that makes it even more confusing. And the most expensive sliver of the whole healthcare system are these dual eligibles. They are incredibly complex and incredibly expensive because they have lots of medical problems and they've got lots of poverty on top of that. Um, so a, a significant focus of our work has been picking up these kinds of patients. Um, you know, and the problem right now in America is that uh, all over the country, we are uh, moving Medicaid into Medicaid managed care. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. The only issue I have a problem with is that the, the model that Medicaid managed care uses to help these kind of patients is telephonic care coordination and case management. Calling people with no phones and unstable addresses on the telephone who are really sick and overwhelmed is not going to do anything. We've got to get the nurses out of the cubicles of these companies and, and instead use that money to buy community-based outreach services that actually go out and visit people. And it's a much better use of our money. So we're spending a huge amount of money that I can't put my finger on exactly how much all over the country that's a mix of federal and state dollars to buy telephonic case management for poor people, which makes absolutely no sense. It doesn't make any sense for middle class people. It doesn't make any sense for poor people. Someone calling you who you don't know on the telephone is usually a bill collector, or it's probably a call that you don't want to hear. You know, it's not an effective way of care coordinating and care managing. You've got to have face-to-face -face contact with people. And Melanie wanted to know, are you experiencing differences in the the inputs and the outputs between the duals and the non-duals in, um, in your 
I hear data. Generally speaking, the duals are, um, you know, relatively higher cost. They are um, more utilization, some more inpatient and ER visits, and they're harder. They take more work. Um, so other than that, I can't tell you conclusively because we haven't yet split our data in that way. And um, I'm seeing a bunch of questions from people saying, you know, do you know about this program in, in my state or my city and, you know, what's going on for my population because folks are calling in from all over the country. Is there a kind of clearinghouse resource where people can find out you know, who uh, is experimenting with these models um, in, in their community? The states where I know this kind of work is going on are New York, Oregon, Colorado, Rhode Island, Delaware, Alaska. Um, we're going to be working with 10 communities going forward starting this month um, to uh, to to share some of our ideas. We, we get calls from all over the country. Um, you know, there's, this is an idea and a theme that's um, occurring all over the place. So I guarantee if you go knock on the door of your state Medicaid agency or someone in your local community is beginning to, to think about this kind of work. Um, so, you know, we can't handle, you know, 80 press people coming to visit us or, um, banging on our door, I'd encourage you to try and find uh, local champions who are beginning to think about this kind of work. Um, and maybe that's something I can work with you, Michelle, to figure out how to, how to listen. Yeah, to we'll look for some resources and maybe websites and so on um, that we can share with you on our, um, on our web page. Um, either look this afternoon or even tomorrow. We should have some stuff on the, the webinar page. Um, I'm going to take a question now from Laura Frank. Laura, did you want to ask your question? Yes, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, um, Dr. Brenner, this is Laura Frank from iNews in Denver. We met last week at the Colorado Health Symposium, so I'm thankful to Michelle Absolutely. for this opportunity to follow up. I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about um, the impact of policies and legislation versus community level education and other efforts. Where are you really think you're going to see the biggest bang for the buck? On um, both of those, I'm suspecting you may say it, it's going to take both, but I'm interested in um, your view on the differences. So it's a great question. I think I would categorize that question as a question of, you know, what lever do you pull and at what scale do you pull the lever to get better care at lower cost? And the answer is this is the most complicated pro pro problem I've ever touched because every time I pull a lid up on the problem, I find more misalignment and more kind of bizarre bureaucratic problems. Um, so I, I wish that I could just hide in Camden and take care of patients, and that didn't work. My office went out of business. You know, over 10 years, we form a nonprofit. We run around and find high-cost patients. We assemble data that no one's ever been able to assemble and we start caring for them. And I say, hey, I think we're doing a good job down here. How about you, the Medicaid HMO, or you, the state, share some of the savings we're generating? Oh, we don't know how to do that. It's complicated. So we, you know, we team up with the Chamber of Commerce to pass a law. It's, you know, a year later, and they're still writing the regulations. <laughs> you know, the, there's a fight between the feds and the state about some of the issues and the federal state issues and the legislation. So, you know, so now I, neither can I hide in my office, nor can I hide in Camden. Now I've got to go to Trenton, and now I've got to go to CMS in D.C. to, like, straighten this thing out. So it's the most complicated mess I've ever seen, and it can't just be me doing this. We had patients from Camden go and testify to get this legislation passed. We had, we bring patients with us when we go to D.C. because, you know, policymakers need to see the faces behind these problems. They need to hear patient testimonials about how broken the delivery system is. So, you know, so the answer is that you can't just pull one lever. I've tried that. If I could stick to just taking care of patients, I would have done that. Um, this problem is a mess. Dr. Brenner, um, you know, I've heard some who are trying to uh, follow the kind of model that you're espousing say that fee-for-service cannot work with accountable care organizations, and yet that is still the heart of the healthcare system post-reform. So uh, what's your thinking on that? 
I think part of what um, the dialogue that reporters need to build with their readers is explaining the downside of fee-for-service medicine is that what's happened in America is that we're getting too much care and we're getting disorganized care. So let me give you a very small example of that. The very famous study looking at arthroscopy, which is a bread and butter procedure for people who have uh, chewed up cartilage in their knee. And it's often 50, 60 year old people who are overweight who've had swelling and pain in their knee. Normally we would do an x-ray, an MRI, we do an ACEWRAP, Motrin, maybe physical therapy, and it show wear and tear in the knee. They'd eventually see an orthopedist, they'd get injected in the knee, with steroids, and then they'd eventually get an arthroscopy, which is where they put a scope in and they do a trim job on the meniscus. So we finally did a randomized controlled trial to see if it works. And they randomized people to a sham arthroscopy, which is where they put the scope in, took it back out while you were sleeping, and you woke up with a Band-Aid on your knee, and you didn't know whether you had the trim job or the sham where they just put the scope in and pulled it back out. And it turned out that both groups got better at the same rate. We do 650,000 arthroscopies a year. And the reason people get better is if I took any of you out of work for 12 weeks, if I put you in physical therapy, a gym three times a week, and told everyone in your family that you didn't need cook or clean, you'd all be healthier. So, you know, tragically, that's a major revenue driver for hospitals. And what happened is we set a really high price for all those procedures. And then we ran out of sick people who actually need the procedure done to them. So we put up billboards, we did more advertising, and it still didn't work because all the hospitals are competing over the same limited pool of sick people. So they start working down the continuum to less and less sick people. If you're an athlete, an arthroscopy is a miracle. They tap down the, the teared meniscus and it's a great thing. But we ran out of athletes. So there are many examples like that of procedures that are widespread that we do every day that you guys tout in your articles that just don't work. And another famous example is angioplasty, which is a stent to open up a blood vessel. If you have an acute heart attack, it's a miracle. But we started stenting 90% stenosis and 80% and 70% and 60% on and on. And they did a randomized controlled trial to show with people with stable coronary artery disease, if you randomize them to medication management, or to an angioplasty, they get better at the exact same rate. We do a million angioplasties a year, and a ton of them are, are a waste of time, money, and they're dangerous for people. But we don't talk about that. And in fact, the current budget for the House of Representatives defunds the entire part of government that pays for this kind of research. Um, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research, it's the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, where they just zeroed out this whole part of the federal government because they don't want government to get between you and your doctor. And someone needs to get between you and your doctor because they're doing lots of unnecessary stuff that you don't need and it's not helping you. So, you know, we've got a huge problem that you guys aren't talking about. And, you know, you need to talk about what's good care and what's not good care and what the cost drivers are. And the cost drivers are unnecessary care, unnecessary care, and unnecessary care. And uncoordinated care and fragmented care. And the reason it's happening because how we pay for healthcare services. So we have uh, about six more minutes and uh, I think your remarks are a good segue to a question by Lisa Zamoski. She says, I'm with the LA Times. I'm wondering if this model was widely adopted, uh, what it would mean for the future of both hospitals and health insurance companies in terms of their business model. Would this kind of fundamental change really take place? So hospitals right now couldn't afford to lose 5% of their bed days. They'd all close down. So they're facing a blockbuster video moment. They're facing a Kodak moment. So Kodak had an existential threat to its business model called digital photography. And they had the patents and they sat on the sidelines because they were making too much money on the legacy system. Same thing blockbuster video. Must have had a moment when the young executive said people are renting videos online. And the blockbuster video executive said, no, 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 no. People spend you know, an hour in our store. They must love it there you know, they won't stop coming, and now they're boarded up all over the country. So this is a, you know, fundamentally better care at lower cost is disruptive change, and it's an existential threat to the current healthcare system. And, you know, that's why it has never taken off. And, you know, hospitals can't cover their fixed costs. It's like the auto industry. The auto industry had to have a certain level of consumption when the number of autos purchased went down below that threshold, 
they were losing scads of money. You know, if hospital beds are not filled with people um, who don't need to be there, the hospital industry would go to business. It's a sick care industry, not a health care industry. So, you know, and it's not that the executives are bad people. It's not that the doctors are bad people. It's the economic drivers. It's the system. It's the rules that we made. The primary driver of this is the Medicare fee schedule and how Medicare operates. All private insurance operates off the same payment model. When they negotiate rates between an insurer and a hospital, it's a percent off Medicare in most instances. Medicare is the 500-pound gorilla. They drive everything. So, you know, this is the system that we made, and this is the rules that we made, and they're just playing by the rules. So will it change? You know, our back's finally against the wall. The bulk of the federal debt is health care, and half of that debt is doctors and hospitals. The only way to balance long-term debt is going to be to take money out of that. You either are going to ration or rationalize, and I fear sequestration. We may go off the cliff in January where they just do cross-the-board cuts. Um, you know, so I think this system is headed for a crisis, and the question is, how fast is it going to come? I think that you know we probably have the largest economic bubble, capacity bubble, in the history of mankind because healthcare is 18 percent of the economy, whereas housing is 11 percent and finance is 7 percent. So this economic bubble is much much larger, and it's floating on a sea of debt that's backed by state governments. A lot of hospital bonds are. Um, are backed by state government. So the, you know, the big win if you're an investor is to go short on hospital bonds in the next five years. So um, I just want to say that right now we have uh, 77 people participating and a bunch of questions. Dr. Brenner, if you are available to stay for another 15 minutes, um, we can continue to ask, uh, answer people's questions here. Uh, is that possible? Um, yes, that would be fine. And your calendar is showing to everybody right now, just so you know. But uh, <laughs> I want to put your PowerPoint back. But um, okay, great. And uh, let me just say to those who need to go in one minute that we will be putting up all these uh, data resources um, on our website and sending you a note with a link to all these. And if you want to participate in other um, webinars or in um, just our online community, which includes blogging and resources, you can join Reporting on Health as well, uh, reportingonhealth.org. But let me go back now to a question from Peggy Kint. Uh, Peggy, I'm going to unmute you. Peggy? OK. Uh, well, we have a couple of other questions here. Um, one question from uh, Barbara Fader Ostrov is, how much of the stalemate is due to physicians wanting to retain control and medical interventions and resisting protocols and other cost-cutting higher productivity models? I think that's a huge issue, which is when you're comfortable, you know, no one wants to change. So, you know, I think physicians have been given a blank check and enormous amounts of autonomy, and we haven't dealt with the blank check very responsibly. Um, you know, about 70% of the purchasing decisions for patients are made by their doctors. So, um, you know, I, the whole system is a little bit like how we made cars back in the 1880s and 1890s. Back then, a car was a work of art, and they were made in, a, in an artist's studio. And the, the parts were not in, interchangeable, and the cars were incredibly expensive, so only the wealthy could own one. Then Henry Ford figured out how to systematize and protocolize and create an assembly line where he broke down the work product into individual steps, standardized them, and they were able to make cars much cheaper and much faster and everyone could afford one. I think we have the same problem in healthcare, which is each patient right now is kind of a work of art. And each unit of service delivery is an is a uh, un unstandardized, unsystematized process. And lots of errors happen in non-standard processes. You know, it's a little bit like an orchestra with 50 really, really world-class talented people. And each individually plays great, but they don't play on rhythm, and they can't play in key. And they're being paid per note. So, um, 
you know, we have given doctors individually, we have paid them a lot, we've given them a blank check for our society, and we've given them lots of autonomy. And what we need to do now is we need to systematize and protocolize and restructure how we deliver care, which inevitably is going to erode some of their autonomy. And it should erode some of their autonomy. So um, related question from uh, Linda or Lindsay uh, McCormick. She says, Dr. Brenner, uh, while you say that there are fewer vested interests in keeping poor people in hospital beds, isn't it also the case that there are many providers vying for patients' Medicaid dollars? What has been your experience distinguishing from shoddy clinics looking to skim Medicaid dollars versus providers uh, that are genuinely interested in helping? Um, I think that's a really good question. First of all, our hospitals are, Camden's really small. It's only nine square miles. So all the hospitals are suburban facing. So their primary revenue driver are middle and upper class patients in the suburbs. So we also started with the category of people that none of them wanted, which were homeless, mentally ill, diabetics with foot ulcers lying in emergency rooms. So it was, you know, I can't say that that just happened to be the people I was interested in. Now I look back and realize that that was really strategic because the the part of the market share we started on were the people that they least wanted, and we've been chipping away since then. Um, as far as the other parts of the system, there is certainly plenty of fraud in Medicaid. Um, you'd have to commit a lot of fraud to make much money on the Medicaid side of primary care in New Jersey. I think a lot more of the fraud is probably happening on the durable medical equipment, which are crutches and canes and shoes and wheelchairs and other things. Um, you know, there has been some fraud historically in Camden. I frankly think the much bigger problem is just disorganized healthcare delivery and misaligned incentives. So, you know, fraud is a problem out there. It does happen. But I think we've got much, much bigger problems. Michelle, can you hear me? We'll take a question. Hello? Michelle, go ahead. We'll take the next yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, this is a question from Carol Morton. She says, this data is hard to get, as Dr. Brenner said. How can others get this kind of data? Who can get it? Uh, is there uh, reporters, researchers, and can this kind of reform be done without the data that can be recrunched to define the problem and show results of interventions? I think the data is crucial. It's a phenomenal question. And I think this is really a question of transparency. And I think it's a great you know, public issue to champion that in the end, we're not going to fix the system unless we out all this data. And there are real privacy concerns with this data. But we've had the data for 10 years. And we've done a very good job of protecting the data. Believe it or not, we have 10 years of Camden data from three hospitals. That's patient level. We have two hospitals in Trenton, two hospitals in Newark, nine hospitals in North Jersey, and three counties in Maine on two hard drives that are $50 hard drives that are encrypted, password protected. Only two people in my organization have access. They're locked in a safe. We use Microsoft Access and off-the-shelf access and um, a mapping program called ArcView. And I've got a really talented 23-year-old who's getting a master's at Penn, who's doing a lot of this analysis. So the problem is not the analysis. It's, it's very inexpensive to do this work. It's getting access to the data. And you know, I think this is a great public policy challenge, would be to free the data. And uh, HIPAA, you know, federal privacy guidelines, do not prevent using data like this. When you go to a hospital and you sign that release form, it says that your data can be used for um, quality improvement, care management, care coordination, treatment, and billing. You know, it has a whole list of different purposes for the data. What we're doing well falls within that. 
so this is not a violation of HIPAA at all. But this is business intelligence that the healthcare system doesn't necessarily want to share. This is their customer business intelligence. This would be like, you know, you giving up your subscription list for your newspaper. Okay. Um, I have a question from a health geriatric journalist. You had mentioned that uh, you would have your legs cut out from under you if, if you tried this with a more affluent population. And the question was, who would cut your legs out from under you? Um, if the hospitals saw a reduction in bed days, or the doctors who were dependent on the inpatient visits, or the procedures attached to those inpatient visits saw their volume go away, it would be a really serious problem. We have a question from Kay Kaufman who says, can Dr. Brenner talk about the primary care doctor shortage and how this plays in with the whole situation? Sure. And so, also, oh yeah. Uh -huh. So an average salary for primary care providers is about 150000 a year. Specialists make two to three times as much, 300, 400, 500. When you look at the top 1% in America, the single largest professional group in the top 1% are physicians. And half of their salary is due to the Medicare fee schedule. So an act of Congress set a fee schedule for health care services paid by the government, which enabled one professional group to move up into the top 1%. So um, why would any med student ever want to become a primary care provider? And the entire driver for this is the Medicare fee schedule. So until that's changed, none of this is going to change. Kids have a lot of debt. And every day in primary care office, you do a tremendous amount of unpaid work, two to three hours of unpaid work. When you call your primary care doc and leave a message and they call you back, that's unpaid work. When you, the doc stays in the room for beyond 15 minutes to explain something to you, that's unpaid work. When they call you about your mammogram result, that's unpaid work. They should be calling you about that abnormal result and explaining it to you. When you call and you want to get a question on the phone answered, and they say, no, 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 you have to come in, or you have to come in to get that result, that's because that's unpaid work. The only way they can get paid is to have you come in. So that's such a mistake to, to organize care in that way. Um, so kids don't want to go into primary care. It's an incredible field of medicine. It's so enriching personally, but it's um, a financial zero. So I don't think we're going to get ahead of this. I don't see the freight train suddenly turning on the tracks. Um, so I, I think we're going to be way behind in the number of primary care providers that we need. Even nurse practitioners and physician assistants don't want to do primary care. They're all specializing because they can make way more money in uh, specialties. So I think the only answer is probably going to be protocolization and delegation and making primary, offices, primary care offices function much more efficiently. So I'll give you an example. A primary care provider, so I might have two hours of lab work and, and results to look at each evening. I should never look at a normal result. All over the country, primary care providers are looking at mammograms, paths, labs that are normal. I should never look at that stuff. It should all be protocolized, and behind the scenes, a lower-level staff member should just take care of that result if it says normal. So that's a small example of, you know, there's a lot of time wasted in healthcare, and I don't think we're going to have more people to do the work. Instead, we need to build systems of care that take work off the desk of the primary care providers that they don't need to do. And there was a related question to this, for this uh, last one, which is, how do you, does your model in Camden apply to areas outside of major cities, especially rural areas? Um, Maine is doing a wonderful job of putting health teams out in the field. Um, so, you know, we'll let you know in a year. I would call Maine up and see how they're doing. Um, I've worked with York, Pennsylvania, and had a chance to sit in on a case conference where primary care providers um, we're each picking up one or two of their own high-cost patients who keep going to the ER and hospital over and over. And as I sat in the case conference, the issues were almost identical, that human suffering is common wherever you go. And there are certainly unique issues in Camden, but people get high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, heart failure, 
you know, they become wheelchair dependent, they get depressed, isolated, they have transportation problems everywhere you go. So I think the basic elements of all this will probably, um, you know, stand up wherever you go. Um, we have a question here uh, from James uh, saying, uh, describe a path to change from fee-for-service to fee-for-health focused care. That's a phenomenal question, and I think it starts with shared savings. So that's why our legislation starts with shared savings. So everyone would bill the way they normally bill. So we're not interfering with the way anyone bills. But if we collectively, working together, bend the total cost curve, then we can get a portion of that back. And I'm going to make a bet in the game of life that if we just got a small portion of that coming back to the coalition, and then I split that up to the providers, as an incentive payment, that that would be a market signal to them that indeed the world is starting to change. And in some ways, the Affordable Care Act has sent that market signal out to hospitals. I have never seen more change in my career in the hospital environment. Um, they have seen the writing on the wall that the fee-for-service system is about to change, and they don't want to be left behind. So sometimes you don't need to make huge changes to flip a marketplace if you send consistent signals from top to bottom. And I'm, I'm mystified that realigning incentives and getting off of the fee-for-service system isn't a clear bipartisan issue. And in some ways, our legislation in New Jersey shows that there's bipartisan appetite for rethinking how we pay for health care. I think another example of a stepwise process would be episode of care payments. So in an episode of care payment, you, for like a hip, hip replacement, you pay 30 days before and 60 days after one fee for everything, the physical therapy, cardiology, anesthesia bill, the hospital bill, the orthopedic bill, everything, one fee. And then they all have to sit down and work together to figure it out. You know, right now, when the doctors show up in the operating room, the orthopedist and the anesthesiologist they don't sit down ahead of time and plan out your care with the physical therapist and then sit down afterwards and say what went well, what didn't go well. So, you know, the public's spending like $20,000 for that and no one is planning it all out. There's no, you know, it's back to the analogy of the orchestra. You know, they're each playing like great soloists, but, you know, no one's working together to make sure that there's great outcomes. So, you know, most of the time that works, but, you know, when there's a problem, when there's a bad outcome, if there's a a complication, people just get lost. You know, we still have other questions here, and so what I'm going to suggest is, uh, because our time is coming to an end and the webinar will end and we'll all disappear here, is that if you have a question that wasn't answered, uh, email it to editor at reportingonhealth.org. We will shoot those questions uh, to Dr. Brenner and try and get some answers to to them. I'm seeing some great questions here, but we just we just don't have time. Um, I want to just um, thank Dr. Brenner for this really enlightening uh, presentation and thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, to find out about other webinars we host and to participate in an online conversation about health and health journalism, please join reportingonhealth.org, our online community. Once you're a member, you can post your own stories on your profile, blog, and share your ideas with thousands of others. And again, for more information, you can email editor at reportingonhealth.org. We plan to upload the webinar recording in a few hours along with other resources. We also will be sending you a quick survey. Please take a moment to complete it so that we can be sure to deliver talks that are useful and productive for all of our listeners. Thank you so very much, and thank you, Dr. Brenner. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, if you want more information about our organization, it's at www.camdenhealth.org, www.camdenhealth.org. And we'll be doing webinars that are much more detailed about the clinical model and data and other things. So uh, if you have more interest in that, you can log on to our website. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.